says, I recently injured my hamstring while running. This happens just as I am starting a full distance triathlon training plan, which is kind of frustrating. Uh, man, Steve, I can feel the frustration. That would be tough. Um, he says, I'm not in a rush to get back to training because, or back to running because I don't want to re-injure my hamstring. I also have plenty of time until my A race in September, which is Ironman Maryland. Um, but then says in the interim, I want to fill up my training T or my running TSS with something else. So basically substituting the running for something else. Do you recommend adding bike or swim workouts in there instead? If so, should I try to mimic the intensity of the run workouts or should I temporarily switch my triathlon base plan with something more cycling is cycling specific as a way to fill up my TSS and then sprinkle in swims as appropriate. Any advice would be appreciated. Thanks. Uh, Steve, you are a true triathlete data-driven person. I understand this feeling of like, I have a hole and it's quantifiable. Therefore I should fill it with the same quantity. Like, <laughs> you know, like that's, that's the tendency that we all have for sure. Um, Pete, uh, do you want to kick us off on this one? Your thoughts? Yeah. Yeah. I like this one because this is such an obvious, uh, yeah, the, this is an obvious solution to a problem that a lot of people experience. Um, where if, if you can't do something, it, just like you said, there's, there's a hole or a void and I'm just going to fill the same thing. And then I will progress just like I should be in this new, um, state that I'm in. Um, and I think m one of the main problems with this is you, no matter how you got injured in the first place, um, there's something to think about anytime you get a setback of any way, shape or form, that's a good opportunity to kind of reevaluate where you are, where you're trying to go, and the best way to use your time. Um, and I think this gets overlooked a lot. Um, if you have an A event and it's six or seven months away, um, for a lot of people, the best thing they they should be doing with their time and energy isn't adding more volume right this second with things you're already good at. Um, and it happens, it happens to everybody, it's happened to me, um, where you have this opportunity where if you're not, if you're not running all of a sudden you have three more hours a week. Um, and so for me personally, if I had three more hours a week, um, I would probably be spending my time doing more strength training and more mobility and probably cooking healthier meals. And that would do more for my trajectory as an athlete than doing more training at this point in my life. Um, and so what, what everybody can do is if you have a starting point and ending point, you have to maximize your time in between, but you really have to look at what's limiting yourself and then what you can do to push those limits up, because that's where you're going to get the most return on your time. Um, and even though it's an obvious choice to do more training for a lot of people, more training, isn't going to get, uh, this is another blanket statement for a lot of people. There's multiple ways they could use their time. They could split it up. There might be some more training. There might be some diet. There might be some strength. There might be more recovery, but making sure you're not doing a, like a one part solution for your problem is what changes you, um, to get you further overall. Um, and the TSS is, this is one I feel like we have to say, we'll just say it every week for the, for the rest of forever. Um, don't chase TSS chase what you're supposed to do at the right time. Um, and then that's going to maximize your time. So I, I think it's really difficult to step back and look at yourself as an athlete and figure out what your limiters are. But like we always say, ask some of your friends, ask your coach, ask someone who's experienced in what you're trying to do and help ask them to help you figure out what could be limiting you as an athlete and then start breaking down your time to tackle those problems rather than just directly adding more training on top of something. Great points. Uh, Alex, uh, what, what thoughts do you have on this one? Yeah. Um, I actually just went through this with my hip. I woke up one morning and my hip flexor had acted up and I couldn't do my workout or my strength training and definitely like the mental side of things is right. Like, how can I, how can I do these one legged or <laughs> <laughs> figure out a way, but <laughs> My, if my I do it twice on one leg, <laughs> it equals the same, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I just, Alex is like, stop it, guys. Move. That's exactly what I thought. <laughs> yeah. That's it. Why is this funny? <laughs> but yeah, I mean, after I get through all that mental, like back and forth, my go-to is filling 
the training time with recovery time. So say, for example, I had a two hour ride on the schedule. Um, I do this for two reasons. One, it gets some dedicated time to, to fix what's going on. And two, it keeps it in my schedule. So it's like, I can't ride, but it keeps that like block on my schedule from getting filled with other things. It's still like athletic time, if you will. So for me with the hip flex, it was like, I knew what happened. I knew I like, wasn't keeping up with the mobility, wasn't keeping up with the rolling and wasn't in this case doing the, the couch stretch as often as I should be. So there are some good things to be drawn from this. Like in my particular situation, it was good that it happened in the off season. It was a reminder that like, if this happened during the season and you neglected it, this could happen right before race day. So it's kind of like something to remind you like to be on top of these things. Um, in this particular case, I did know exactly what to do because it's something that I'd experienced before. And I know like true injuries are different, right? Like if you crash, but talking in like the vein of overuse injuries or like nagging injuries, it's good to have a, a set of like prehab, like Jonathan, I think of you and your knee, like, you know what you need to do to keep that in check now. So it's kind of getting to that point where you understand what you need to do to be functional at your sport. So I think it's a good time to find out what those things are, you know, try a few stretches. Um, sometimes with, with true injury, that time is for rest. So it's like, if I set that two hours aside and the best thing for my injury is to nap, then it's like, then I have that time to do that. And I let myself do that so that I can come back stronger. So it's not always, and that's where it gets difficult, right? It's not something always active. Like I'm going to go stretch it and it's going to feel better right after I'm going to go get a massage and it's going to feel better right after. Sometimes it's just time and rest and that can be the hardest but setting aside that time and allowing yourself to rest and telling yourself like this is the best thing i can be doing right now is super helpful imagine putting all the time and energy you do into training into recovery into nutrition into something like that it's going to make your training more productive and easier so like it's a great opportunity to to double down on that and actually like if you have workouts on the calendar from four to five you were going to be training don't, don't get rid of that time. Like keep that time there and let that time be sacred. Let it be set apart and something special for you to be able to still work on becoming the athlete you want to become. Um, you, it may not be training, but you just keep the time block the same and you can uh, throw stuff in. And Alex, what you mentioned for multi-sport athletes in particular with injury is it's so common just because of the strain of doing all the three different sports and, and the volume that a lot of them take on with doing the, you know, the longer distance stuff. That's a super good point to that. Amber, yeah. a question on the swim side, because the usual thing that I hear multi-sport athletes do is like, Oh, injury, especially if it's lower body, like legs, hips, knees, ankles, foot, get in the pool, like spend mm -hmm. that time in the pool. That's what I hear most commonly. Uh, do you have, I, I know that you haven't been a triathlete, but being a swimmer and also a cyclist and understanding things the way you do, do you have any insight on that? Yeah. I, first thing I want to say is just to, uh, Jonathan mentioned something that I thought was really important and I don't want to forget it. So I'm just going to jump to that and then I'll come back to the swimming part of it, which is just imagine if this injury happened two weeks before your big event. I mean, it's actually really, I mean, if an injury was going to happen, this is probably the best time for it to happen. So by taking the time to make sure that you heal this completely and really, really well, you ensure that you're not going to spend, you know, instead of, you know, take, I don't know, four or six, however long you need to heal this thing completely so that you don't end up spending months having it recur and having to manage it again and having it come back again. And then also you don't want, you don't want this to come back and haunt you in the weeks and months before the big event. So the sooner you, I mean, of course, the sooner you can heal the better, but more importantly, the better you can heal right now, the better, because then you're going to set yourself up for the, the highest likelihood for success. So prehabbing and making sure that you're doing all of the things that you need to do to heal this thing, even if that means just resting. And even if that means tanking your TSS for a while, that's the most important thing you can do because all the training in the world right now is not going to help you if you have a nagging hamstring injury for your entire season. So that's mm -hmm. the, the number, number one thing. In the meantime, there are other constructive things you can do. So if in addition to the appropriate amount of rest, you want to work on some other things, there are certainly some technique stuff that you can work on in the pool. Um, I'll share a story. So when I was in college, I ended up having to get shoulder surgery and I was rehabbing after that shoulder surgery. 
So when I got back in the pool, when I had enough range of motion, the physical therapist told me I was only allowed to do breaststroke. I couldn't do freestyle backstroke butterfly. And on my first day back, I was only allowed to do one lap. That's it. 25 yard pool, not even a 50 meter pool. <laughs> I was allowed oh. to do one lap of breaststroke in a 25 yard pool. One and then second, the next Amber, day, can I add some context to this? Because how yes. many years had you been swimming by this point doing <laughs> so endless laps in fifties? <laughs> like, so doing this is this probably is like, my 12th year of, of like full on <laughs> swim training. It was like, this is, this your is workout like the, is one lap. <laughs> it's the equivalent of like doing like, you're going to pedal for 30 seconds at zone one, right? Like it's, yes. it's gotta feel like, what am I even doing? <laughs> That's exactly how I felt. Like, what is even the point of this? And then literally on the second day, people he said, okay, you can swim two laps. And on the third day you can swim three laps. It was maddening, but I was so lucky because one of the assistant coaches at the time was this brilliant guy. Um, and he sat me down and he's like, okay, we've got one lap. How are we going to get the most out of this one lap? And I was kind of like, oh, give me a break, man. It's one lap. Like <laughs> get out of here with your one lap. But he said, let's, let's focus on distance per stroke. And in swimming distance per stroke is like, if it's a, it's a really key metric that you can use to identify how efficient your technique is. So I did one lap trying to take as few strokes as I possibly could. And then the second day when I had two laps, I tried to get both of those laps under the number of strokes that I'd had the day before. And I had to be so focused on my technique to do this. I ended up, so when I was a swimmer breaststroke, I was a, an individual medley swimmer, which meant that I do all four strokes and breaststroke was always my weakest leg. I took my breaststroke time down from, I think it was 110 in the hundred breaststroke down to like 102, 103 that season in one wow. season and, and in swimming to take 10 seconds off a hundred, a hundred yard time is like unheard of, but that focus, faster. right. <laughs> Amazing how that math works out. <laughs> 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 But that, that focus on technique and efficiency paid off big time and it wasn't TSS. It wasn't absolute strength. It wasn't power. It was technique. And so that's something that I think, especially in triathlon, you can really make huge gains on that front. So if it's not going to set back your hamstring, if it's not going to take away from the rehab that you need to be doing with that, you can do some, you know, some drills in the pool. I would stick with the long axis stroke. So backstroke and freestyle, you can swim with a pull buoy so that you're, you're really isolating that upper body and you can do some really awesome form drills, do 10 and tens where you're doing, um, holding 10 on each side. Uh, you can do breath control. Um, you know, I wouldn't do flip turns. I would do really gentle grab turns so that you're just being super, super easy, making sure that you're not using that hamstring too much, but focus on quality over quantity for this time. You can get you can make some really, really big gains that will pay off big time, big time down the road, but it's not going to come in the form of TSS right now. And I think that's important to kind of wrap your head around. This is a, another thing I hear a lot of triathletes say is basically like, if you have an, an, an injury, like a hamstring injury, you definitely don't want to run, but you can ramp up the volume on the bike. And, and I've heard that said before, like, yeah, well, I mean, I had a hamstring in injury, so I spent a lot of time on the bike and in the pool and just less time on the run. Uh, but I don't know about you. I use my hamstrings quite a lot when I pedal, <laughs> like, yeah, like, it's not <laughs> like time. it's some sort of dormant muscle and, and cycling is such a repetitive action on that muscle. I know that you're not doing something where it's like, you know, uh, some sort of full on, like a hamstring curl or something. It's still very straining on the muscle. So it's, you know, you don't want to just find a different way to stress the muscle, right? Instead, you want to give yourself the time to recover, right, Alex? Yeah. Uh, I actually wanted to just tie in two things that I heard over these last two questions that I think would be helpful. One, you said respect the time for training. And I think just overarching, this is a super important, like I've, I've talk to people who ask about my consistency and I will preface it with the fact that I am very lucky in my situation. My fiance is a athlete as well. So she gets it. She respects that time and we don't have children at the moment. So like, there's nothing like fighting for my time besides work and responsibilities that I have. But I think the first step is really owning that time. I think a lot of people feel guilty because their, their goals aren't big enough in their mind, right? Like I just want to win cat two. And it's like, 
really own those really like I want to win cat too. Like, and I need this time to do that. I think you got to be the first one to respect that time for other people too. So I think kind of just setting that aside and being like, this is my time to train and it's important to me. And, and owning that is a big piece to consistency. And then Amber mentioned this in both, I think, or at least it was in the notes for the first one, but there's so much more you can do besides TSS. You can focus on cornering. You can focus on, you know, mentally preparing yourself. You could meditate with that time. Like there's so many other things that you can do to improve performance that aren't physically measured that Mm -hmm. you can do with this time, whether when you're injured or like when we were talking about those soul rides, right? There's other things you can do that will benefit your training rather than just pumping out watts. And yes, that that's coming from me. There's, there's other things you can do besides watts. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. This is, and it's really tough when you have racing that you're missing too. like, as a result of this, I've been in this position before where I had to basically take like a whole season off, uh, to really do what everyone said here, which was just respect the injury, give it the, give it its own due respect. And as a result, that meant that I needed to put a halt to everything else so that I could actually give it the the time, space, and attention that it needed to be able to resolve it. And that meant missing a ton of races. And that's hard. Like, especially for a person like Pete, like Pete thrives on races. Um, if there was a race in Reno every day, it would be super bad for Pete because Pete just would not yeah. be able to not chase those balls. Like golden retriever after ball, he would have to race. Like I would explode. To happen. I, yeah. I would explode. <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. So, but you, you have to get to a point where you, your priorities are, are set toward a, a specific goal rather than getting too distracted with making sure that you're checking off the boxes. Like we talk about being process oriented and it's very important, but those process goals can never lose a true North, North star. Right. And that North star should be performance health. Like th- these, these things that are more centered around something that is an achievement of balance and also, you know, rising tides, so to speak. But if you get so focused on the process that you lose sight of the end goal, then it can get really, truly bad. If you like this video, make sure you give us a thumbs up. If you didn't like this video, you can give it a thumbs down, but let us know what you would have done differently in the comments below. If you want to see more of these videos, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if you want to become a faster cyclist, check out trainerroad.com. Do it. If you think I have better hair than Jonathan, give it a thumbs up. If not, leave a comment. My hair is better than his.